Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today we're going to take a look at a booster amplifier for the LM386. If you remember a while ago, if you watched my channel back then, a couple years ago I think it was, I built a output booster for LM386 with limited success. And that's because the LM386 IC has limited output swing and the stage I used before was uh, just an emitter follower. Uh, you know, emitter follower doesn't have any voltage gain, so you're pretty much stuck with the output you get unless you put a stage of voltage application. So that's what I'm going to do here. But first, you might be wondering what's going on with the discrete amplifier project. Well, I decided to cancel that. <laughs> Just kidding. I got a nice package here from DigiKey with a bunch of parts. And I'm waiting for some other parts from Mauser. DigiKey didn't have everything I wanted, so had to get some other parts from Mauser. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, we'll take a look at those parts in the next video. And I'll discuss what's going on with that project in that video. So stay tuned for that. But for now, I'm going to take a look at this booster amplifier. And you might be wondering why use the LM386. It would certainly be better just to use an op amp or you know even a discrete front end. But eh, it's just kind of for fun. A lot of people are familiar with the LM386. So just going to use that here. Okay, so let's take a look at the circuit. Well, it is a push-pull emitter follower type stage. And like I said, these don't have any voltage gain. So I'm going to have to get voltage gain from another stage. This will be what's known as the voltage amplification stage. If you notice, there are no drivers for these output transistors. So when we design this thing, we have to make sure that we have enough current in this stage to be able to drive these output transistors directly. And yeah, this is not going to be a hi-fi amplifier or anything. Uh, just trying to minimize the parts. So we have the Class A driver transistor right here. And we have the diodes here for the biasing and um, thermal tracking. And here is the bootstrap stage. Did the video on that so we'll take some measurements and see how the uh, bootstrap stage is performing there over here is a voltage regulation stage and that's for the lm386 to get decent enough power out of this little amplifier booster i need to run it at 20 volts and can't really run the lm386 at that voltage so i'm going to uh, put this voltage regulator in here. It doesn't have to handle a lot of current because the LM386 is not driving a speaker directly. It only has to put, you know, I don't know, probably around a milliamp of output current to drive this output stage. So it doesn't need a lot of current. It's quiescent current plus the uh, current it needs to put into this transistor here, which is not very much. Okay, so let's take a look at the current these output transistors are going to have to deliver. I'm going to say you know, using a 4 ohm load here and the 20 volt supply and we'll just ignore some of the losses in the output um, transistors and these emitter resistors and say that we can have a 20 volt peak to peak waveform. In other words that means 10 volts peak into that 4 ohm load. So what would the current be for that? Well it's uh, 10 divided by 4 ohms and that gives us 2.5 amps. And because there's some reactants and things we'll give it a little overhead and just say 3 amps. Well, These output transistors I'm going to use have a gain of around 100. I think the ones I have are probably closer to 80 or 90. But, you know, just to be sure, we'll say they have a gain of 80, and I'll base my calculations on that. So, if I take 3 amps divided by 80, 
We need 37 and a half milliamps to be delivered to these transistors, you know, so we can get the current in our output here. It's easier to work with round numbers, so we'll just say 40 milliamps. Okay, so now we need to set up the current in this stage of the amplifier. You can think of each part of this output based around the output node here. So you have the uh, positive half and the negative half. And the negative half will have the driven element. It will have the transistor here. But we need to look at setting the current here. So what you could do is just ignore this bootstrap circuit and pretend that there's just one resistor here. And what is the value needed? Well, with the output conducting 3 amps, you'll have some voltage drop across the emitter resistor, uh, about 0.66 volts or so. You have a base to emitter drop, maybe a little bit of emitter resistance. And we can say it would be around 1.4 volts. Well, the output's going to be biased at half the supply voltage, so we have 10 volts from here to the positive rail to work with. So if we say uh, 10 minus uh, 2.4 volts, that leaves us with 8.6. 8.6 divided by 0.04, you know, it's just Ohm's law again. 0.04 milliamps, I should say. Resistor value would be 210 ohms. And since we're going to have a bootstrap circuit here, we have to split that into two. So we have to have the value for each one because they'll be in series. That gives us 105, which I don't have. So we'll just use 100 ohm resistors here. Okay, so now we need to figure out what is the value going to be for this bootstrap capacitor. Well, we want this to function in the frequency range of our amplifier, 20 to 20 kilohertz. But if we would use 20 hertz in our equation, we'll be at the 3 dB down or the pole frequency. Um, so normally you would choose a lower value. Engineers would probably choose like 2 or 3 hertz. But I'm going to say that 10 hertz is good. That way at 20 hertz the effective drop will be pretty minimal. I mean, the limiting factor here is the output capacitor anyway. It's going to roll off the base at a higher value unless you use you know, a very large one. So this forms an RC network and you have to use that in the capacitive reactance equation. So uh, what is the R value? Well it seems to me, you know, when this is functioning, the voltage across the capacitor plate's going to remain the same. Because in the pass band, the voltage drop to AC across this capacitor is going to be very small. And the whole idea of the bootstrap circuit is a constant current through this resistor here, which goes into the base. And, well, it's not perfect, but it, it does the job. So the voltage across this resistor, in order to have a constant current, it's not going to change much. But on the other hand, the voltage drop across this resistor, you know, it's connected from the supply rail to this node of the bootstrap circuit. This is going to vary wildly with the signal. So to me, it seems like this is the other part of the RC network. So if we punch it up, 1 over... 2 times pi times 10, which is the frequency I chose, times 100, gives us 100, about 160 microfarads for this capacitor value. Next is this transistor here. This is our Class A uh, driver in this voltage gain stage. I'm going to have some degeneration here in the emitter. Yeah, you know, the thing is, you're going to have the LM386, which has its built-in set gain, coming into more gain. But we don't really need a lot of gain here. 
we'll have too much gain if we use the full gain of this. So having an emitter resistor here to degenerate the gain of this transistor will be helpful. Might even bring some uh, negative feedback to the LM386. And for this voltage regulator circuit, it's just going to be a uh, Zener diode. I think I found a 9 volt Zener diode. Um, the LM386 doesn't use a lot of idle current and the output current is going to be very limited because it only has to drive this transistor. So if we take 20 volts minus 9, it leaves us with 11. And if we give it about 20 milliamps, I think that will be plenty. So if we do the math again, it's just Ohm's law. 11 volts divided by 0.02. 550 ohms this resistor value should be but I'll just go down to the next closest value I have so 470 and that's just a decoupling capacitor for this side of the voltage regulated output for the LM36 and to set the bias in other words the idle current flowing in the output what I'm going to do is just put a 100 ohm resistor here. Well, actually, uh, it'll be these two. And on this side, I won't put this transistor in yet. I'll just put a, another couple 100 ohm resistors. So that'll make sure everything's balanced. And I can see how much current's flowing with these two diodes. Okay, I have the circuit set up here on the socket board. And I have the 100 ohm resistors on the bootstrap side. could only find a 100 microfarad capacitor that would fit in that tiny space. And the temporary capacitors on the bottom side. And these transistors will plug in when I set this thing up. And nice little heat sink with the rubber band holding it on. You know, we're high tech here on John Audio Tech might remember this from another video I did a while ago. Okay, so what I'm going to do is hook this thing up and I'll see what the current flowing through the output stage is. I have the voltage regulator stage disconnected because I don't want it to skew my results. I'm just going to read what the power supply says. I think the problem is these 1 in 4148s you know, they're meant for small signals and not a lot of current. So pushing that 40 milliamps through them it probably pushes their forward voltage drop up high. So, uh, well these aren't mounted to the heat sink like they should be, but let's see what these 1N4001s do. better but still too much so that means we're gonna to have to resort to something else you know I can put a resistor across this diode bridge I can bias with the transistor circuit which you know it's a little more complex but it's hoping to get away from that if I shunt some of the current using a resistor it will desensitize these diodes a little bit so the thermal stability, the thermal tracking may not work as well. Same as going with one diode and a resistor. But I'll monkey around here and come back with a better solution. So what I ended up doing is going with one diode and one resistor. So I figured I needed about a diode drop across that resistor. So I went with 0.6 volts divided by the uh, current going through here 40 milliamps that gives me 15 ohms you know the the voltage across this is still going to be high so what I did is drop it down to 6.8 ohms and uh, I pop that in there so now I'm getting a bias current of a reasonable 18 milliamps which is fine for this the circuit and it's, uh, I really can't get this diode on the heat sink. I'd have to solder wires and stuff. Just going to see how it thermally performs here, if it thermally runs away or not. 
So I connected the field tech function generator to inject a signal into this part of the circuit. Remember, there's no transistor here, it's just the 200 ohm resistors, 200 ohm resistors here, uh, injecting the signal into this part of the circuit. And let's take a look at the output. Okay, turn on the field tech. And that looks like a pretty nice sine wave. Uh, mainly concerned with crossover distortion. There's not going to be any with bias flowing. If we turn that up. Yeah, I don't see anything. I'm not going to check distortion yet because, you know, the field tech does have its own distortion. So if I turn that on here and turn that off, crank this up. Yeah, there is distortion, but. Uh, I'm sure some of that comes from the field tech, as, a, as I remember, it wasn't perfect, but I don't think it's this bad. A um, couple of percent. Well, I, I don't know. I don't have my pilot signal. I'm not driving it from my music player. Uh, it was probably a, a good 3 or 4 percent of distortion. The second harmonic there is pretty large. But you have to remember there's no negative feedback or anything in operation at this point. Okay, I guess it's time to move on and connect that transistor up for the voltage gain. And uh, get that all biased up and go from there. Alright, so here's what I've done. I put this transistor in. I'm using a 10 ohm emitter degeneration. With 40 milliamps, I'll have about 400 millivolts across this. I don't want to go too much higher because that means my output won't be able to swing as close to the negative rail. And then I have to bias this transistor. So what I did, I've taken right from the output, running through a 22K, and then that goes to the base, and then through a 4.7K. I literally just grabbed a couple of resistors that I thought would work. I didn't really do any calculations. It does turn out that this provides just enough current. You have to figure from this node to here, there's about 9 volts or so, 22K, and um, you know, we got 40 milliamps flowing here, and we'll just say it's a hundred, a gain of a hundred. It's about 400 microamps of current this needs to be biased with. But I'm surprised this works. Though the emitter resistor does kind of desensitize the biasing network somewhat. It makes it so it doesn't have to be real precise. So let's take a look at the signal. I'm going to inject a signal at this point and see what we get on the scope. Okay, here's what we're getting on the output. I'm coming from my music player now. See, there's clipping. It's kind of symmetrical. It's not too bad. A little distorted on the top there. So, um, I gotta set my acquisition here when I use the FFT. It makes the waveform look thicker. It takes uh, peaks out of the signal that the scope is putting in. Uh, distortion peaks, false reading. So, let's turn this off. Okay, here's that distortion. We turn that back. So this is the one percent pilot signal. I'm coming off my music player now. So if I bring this down to get these other distortion nodes lower, let's see. Now we're getting about half percent of a second harmonic and a little bit of a third and a fourth and some other small nodes. With a signal output of 4.12 volts, I have it across the 4 ohm load, 4.12 squared divided by 4 ohms, 4.2 watts. 
not too bad. I was hoping to get around five, maybe six watts from this thing. But, you know, it's looking pretty good. So what I want to do now is uh, put the LM386 in there and let it feed the signal in. And uh, you can see what the final circuit looks like. Okay, it is a couple days later, and I really need to get this done. The video is getting long, and I have a lot of other things to do. Real busy with work this time of year, so I don't have a lot of time for making videos. By the way, the package from Mauser came in, so I'll shoot a video on that relating to the amplifier project. So yeah, I had to get this thing together and working so you know, I can wrap this thing up. Here is the completed schematic. Sure, it can have additional tweaks and things done to it, but uh, like I say, I really need to wrap this up. Uh, I think I got a pretty decent working amplifier. I apologize if I rehash some stuff I said before, but I don't exactly remember where I left off. I think I was talking about this transistor here. So what I'm doing is bringing some signal back to the base of this transistor right from the output node. So what that does, well, that brings some current to bias this, plus it acts as negative feedback. So I went with a 10K and a 2.7K on the lower resistor. Of course, I got the LM386 hooked up. I'm also bringing some feedback over here. You notice it's going to the positive or uh, pin 3, non-inverting. It does seem like it would be backwards. However, if I bring that over here and put the input up here, uh, then I get an oscillator. So it has to be done this way. I also AC coupled the LM386 to this transistor so it doesn't disturb the bias as the uh, feedback is also AC coupled due to the internal arrangement of this IC. It's kind of, if I didn't mention it earlier in the video, this has a ground referenced input stage and it also has built in set gain yet you still can bring some signal back for feedback use. So that's kind of odd the way this chip is set up. As far as thermal stability, you know, I ran this thing for like a half hour and let it get hot. That does increase the bias current, but when I turn the signal off, it cools back down. It doesn't thermally run away. You see, I don't have the diode against the heat sink where it can thermally track better. And I don't want to monkey around just for the circuit, which I'm going to tear down when I'm done. As long as it uh, works so I can get some measurements, we're fine, so we'll run with that. Okay, I have the amplifier hooked up to a forum load, and we'll look at the oscilloscope here and see what kind of output power we're getting. Okay, I'm injecting a 1 kilohertz signal. So you crank it up, there's clipping. See, it's starting to clip on the bottom. I think that's due to the arrangement of that transistor with the degeneration resistor on it. Okay, taking a look at distortion. This is the one kilohertz fundamental. This is the built-in 1% pilot signal at 4.5 kilohertz. Here's clipping. And if I tune that out, look at that. I'm actually quite surprised that I'm not seeing any other distortion nodes. This amplifier is very clean. So now I'm going to turn it up as high as I can and just so we start to see little distortion nodes right about there. So I'll turn the signal back on and we're getting 4.37 volts RMS output. So we take 4.37 squared divided by 4 ohm load impedance. So we're putting out 4.77 watts. Is that good or bad? Well, 
probably with the design of this amplifier this is about as good as you're going to get uh, was kind of hoping for five or six watts but yeah I'll take this it's not too bad really you know starting out with an LM386 that for one can't handle forum loads and uh, it can't really do any better than a watt if I recall at nine volts into an eight ohm load I think we were less than half a watt I have to look back at my old test videos and see what it was but you know we're getting significant more power of course we're running it at 20 volts but that was the idea is to uh, build a booster amp so we could run this at a higher voltage in order to get more output power into a lower impedance load I guess I should probably demonstrate some music playing through this thing one thing I do notice if you can hear that or not there's quite a bit of hiss I do have the gain probably set a little higher than necessary plus using the LM386 that's another reason why you probably would want to use an op amp for less noise but anyhow here is the music demonstration Last but not least, I wanted to show you how the bootstrap circuit is working, like I described in the previous video. So, the yellow trace is connected directly to the output node. I have it DC coupled. The blue is connected to that node on the uh, bootstrap circuit. And that would be at this point right here. So, notice that these are identical so if I stop the oscilloscope identical signal just a higher voltage it's always going to be that amount of voltage higher whatever it was like 5 volts or so so because you have the exact same voltage across this resistor at all times you're going to have the exact same current flowing so that's how this bootstrap acts as a constant current source and in doing so allows for enough current to flow into that upper transistor when the voltage drop from the base and the positive rail becomes very small so that's going to wrap it up for this video thanks for watching